Hello, you're listening to Film Flam Fluey, a movie chat show where I, Kevin Redding, interview my uncle, Jim Redding, and a discussion about a wide variety of topics on the subject of movies and sues. You see, my uncle Jim has always sort of been the movie guru of the family, in that he knows all. He could tell you who the director, actor, actress, production designer, or key grip was on just about any movie ever made. He could tell you when something happened, where it happened, why it happened, how it happened. He's an extremely well-read and knowledgeable guy, not only in terms of movies, but also when it comes to music, television, books, architecture, puppetry, loud, elaborate socks, you name it. But we'll stick to movies today. Over the years, he's really brought culture into my movie-consuming experience. Through him, I found Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, Mel Brooks, Albert Brooks, Werner Herzog, the under-the-radar works of Martin Scorsese, Woody Allen, Stanley Kubrick, the list goes on and on. So recently, I sat down with my Uncle Jim because I love hearing him talk about the subject we're both most passionate about, movies. You never leave a conversation with my Uncle Jim without gaining a few extra tidbits of trivia, and hopefully that will be the case for you, the listeners of this exploration into the wondrous depths of the cinematic ocean. Enjoy. So it's no question that uh, our family, the Redding family, is uh, consumed by movies, obsessive. It's it's rare to go to a, a Redding family event without... Uh, an influx of movie references, quotes, shtick, if you will. Um, and I think I can pinpoint when my obsessiveness began. It was, uh, I think, at the wee age of two. Okay. When I, uh, when I broke the VHS Batman tape, the 1989 Tim Burton Batman, by just replaying one specific scene in general. But overall, the entire movie, I must have watched it maybe six times a day. Um Absolutely, you were consumed. But of course, my favorite thing is that it's not even a scene. It was a moment Mm -hmm. in that film that you just would go back, even like I said, at two years old, that you could go back and you would rewind just to get that. It's like the moment with the the Joker and the glasses. Is that what he puts on? Would you hit a guy with glasses? And and Nicholson does that that little take. And you would just go back and back and back and back and back and get it and watch it. And you know, so, something must have triggered in my in my young brain that this is something that I enjoy. Well, so what do you say? Because I always remember when I, what you're talking about that in our family we were we were always talking about movies, and uh, you know, a real wide range of movies too. You know, it's not like uh, you know there was one style of movie that we watched you know we watched everything in between you know the whole family you know we had we had all the bases covered but i remember one time you were a little kid and we were involved in some conversation and you looked up at me and you, you asked you said how do you know all the things you know about the movies i think i still ask you something. And, uh, well that's the thing is that but you're at like you know you're at that point now where you're just you know consumed with movies and what you know and the things you know that you know that somebody would turn around to you and say you know the same thing how do you know Mm -hmm. you know it's like anything you just get totally involved right in you know like you said it's more than just the story you know it's it's the story it's the movie it's the actor it's the director it's the writer it's the you know all the time and history yeah it's everything you know and like I said, that's how you you embrace movies the way that, uh, you know, everybody in the uh, in the family embraces them. Mm-hmm. And now, with that, do you remember, can you recall what, you know, first kind of awestruck you about movies? Is there a, a specific movie, or do you just kind of remember, you know, family genes or whatever, you just kind of... It was in you the whole time. Well, I just always remember that we were always uh, moviegoers, that we always went to the movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and it wasn't just a, was it just a weekend thing, or was it? No, I mean, it was mostly, you know, when we were kids, it was mostly a weekend thing. You know, in the summertime, of course, it was always the drive-in, you know, which is a whole other right subject you know you know of everybody getting in your pajamas going to the theater double feature seeing a movie 
playing in the playground, coming, watching the second picture. But it was also going to, you know, we, we always went to the movies. And in particular, we went, this is to me the crazy thing when we were kids. Our parents, my parents, Nanny and Papa, especially, they grew up as like uh, Manhattan Bronx moviegoers. Right. So their whole experience with movies is you could walk into a theater at any time of day. Mm -hmm. The movies just kept running. So the movie would go, then in between the movie, there would be a newsreel, a cartoon, a, you know, yeah. whatever it was, and then the movie would strike up again. Just literally a day at the movies. Exactly. So Papa, he had no problem. We would go all the time. Rather than ask, what time does the movie start? We would go to the it's movies. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, we came in halfway through. For some reason, one, this is later in life, but the movie that always sticks out to me is there was a Donald Sutherland movie, The Eye of the Needle, which was like this thriller, spy kind of a thing. And we come in like halfway through the damn movie. Had no idea what's going on or whatever. <laughs> but we sit and watch it. Then sure enough, it starts over again. And you and watch in those what you days, miss. yeah, then we watch what you miss, and you get up and you leave. Yeah. And in those days, like nowadays, there's less. Nowadays, there's more of a buffer in between movies, between coming attractions and everything else. But back in those days, the movie just and kept drop going. Of a hat. Yeah. But to your point, two movies that stick out in my head: Mary Poppins mm. at the Bayshore Cinema, Sunrise Highway. It was a big event. That one I remember in particular. Just going to see uh, Mary Poffins. Totally blown away. Brendan McCurdy and I, later on, we won the school talent show singing a medley of songs from Mary Poffins. Mm -hmm. So that one, you know, what an impression that made for, in, in the first run of that. Yeah. And then the other one was... Uh, help hmm. but the weird thing about this was not even seeing the picture at the theater that you work at the Sable movie theater go to see it Saturday matinee the line literally down the street to Main Street all the way two blocks to Main Street and turning being on the end of that line getting up getting up getting up get up, uh, closed sold out can't wow. get in. But we had been dropped off in town. <laughs> so standing there, and from inside the theater, you just heard the roar wow. of the audience. From from standing out on, on the sidewalk, you heard the audience. Yeah. And you're like, oh yeah, we gotta we gotta get into that. And we saw the next uh, the next performance. But those as a kid, those are two that always uh, stood out. And just that that was a Saturday matinee was the thing you did. Right. Saturday matinee, 50 cents. You go to the Sable Movie Theater, Yokedale Movie Theater. You would go, you'd see two movies, cartoons. One I always remember was that they showed uh, the Batman serial. Like, so the from, 40s. One. From, so back from the 40s. And some guy, you know, this is kind of like in the heyday of the Batman resurgence on TV. Some genius got that idea, said, all right, let me find these, you know, goofy Batman serials. And God love us, you know, you, you sat there for two hours watching one after another, one after another as they ran. That's genius. And, you know, like I said, 50 cents, you saw two movies, you were gone the whole afternoon, two o'clock, always started at two o'clock. And, again, the parents knew they could drive you off, they knew where you were going to be. Again, we're like 10-year-old kids. Can you imagine this day and age? <laughs> With 10-year-old kids, your parents drop you off in the movies. Then they go about their business. Well, yeah, I mean, it, also 10-year-old kids asking to go see a 1940s serial <laughs> might be alarming, too. But and, it's, yeah, it's, it's nothing about it. It's mind-blowing, though. 50 cents. You, you, that's a whole day. You 50 cents. Yeah, it was your whole afternoon. You know, and it was, uh, and like I said, and that was the thing, too, is that, yeah, we watched a 1940 we watched a 1940 serial. We also watched like crazy things. 
there was a company, I forget their name, uh, like Childhood Matinee or something was mm -hmm. the name of the company. And their whole specialty was that this guy would go out and like travel the world and find these crazy movies and then dub them. Oh, wow. So there was this wild... Like crazy foreign movies? And yeah, stuff? but like, like a foreign version of... Uh, like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, like a like a live action, okay. And he would he would dub it, and uh, and one of the ones to this day it still haunts me, Puss in Boots. So the story of Puss in Boots with this huge character, the huge cat in boots, haunts my dreams to this day. <laughs> but that was the thing, uh, skateboard movies. You know, guys who would make, you know, skate... And that was, again, you know, this is the mid-60s. You know, you're seeing skateboard movies. The Endless Summer, the Surfing. great surf documentary. You know, these were all matinees mm. that you would all go see, and you would just go, you know... It, it At that time, it didn't matter what the movie was. You, you, right. We went to the movies. That's what you did. Right. There's no preemptively looking up to see what nah, Rotten you know, Tomatoes score got. The only thing... The only thing is that... Uh, Nanny would always check to make sure what what the Legion of Decency, <laughs> the Catholic Church, had their rating, A1, A2, oh, really? A3, wow. condemned, if you can't oh, see no. the movie. We had to put a fast on over. Later on, in later years, when the, when the James Bond movies, mm -hmm. know, we, we had to get past on that. Right. But yeah, we, we would see those as well. Were those big deals when those were coming? Because they were rifling out in the 60s, those Bond movies. Were those I, I, the coolest movies of all time? Please. Please. Yeah. I, you know, the equivalent. Yeah. Those were, you know, the the hippest movies. And like you said, yeah, the you dangerous movies for you as kids to go see. Yeah. You know, because, you know, there was... I remember going to see uh, just Pop and I, my father and I. We went to see Goldfinger. Mm -hmm. Goldfinger. You know, naked woman in the bed, all dressed in gold. What am I? I'm 10 years old, 11 years old, watching this movie. Yeah. But yeah, no, um, you know, when we were kids, that those Bond movies, you know, that Sean Connery Bond movies, you know, that was, the, of that was the gold standard. You yeah. know, that, that was it. And, you know, as far as action was concerned, you know, you watch them now, and, you know, they're quaint and they're silly right. and they're goofy. But, you know, at the time... You know, this was cutting edge. You know, changed, you know, the way, you know, then you have Get Smart on TV and The Man from Uncle and everything else. And, you know, all of these, you know, Our Man Flint and, you know, everything right. kind of followed in the the, uh, the wake of those James Bond movies. Mm -hmm. Are you of the the mindset, as many people are, that the 70s was kind of the, the best time for movies, the best decade? Um in terms of directors, the, you know, the kind of work they were coming out with, French Connection, Jaws, Godfather, the list goes on. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I certainly kind of fall into that. You know, the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, always when you look back, you know, everything is a little, you know, you don't see all of the, the junk that was out there as yeah, well. Yeah. But yeah, you know, when you just look at who was around, you know, at, you know during the 70s, and especially, I think, for me, because that's when I, um, you know, those are my high school years, you know, in, back in the 70s. You know, so between seeing, you know, junk like The Towering Inferno, The Poseidon Adventure, you know, the pop movies of the day, you know, also seeing things like Last House on the Left, which, you know, I scrubbing my eyes trying to not see that you know texas chainsaw massacre uh you know the altman films the uh taxi driver you know right. these these are blowing your mind mm -hmm. and i always remember too in high school in senior year we had a uh you could take electives and uh one of them was a class called film as literature you know so you, you, we'd watch movies, so you know that was like yeah. a dream. But really, that was like one of the first times that you said, "Oh, you know, this could be something else." Like I remember seeing uh, the Bicycle Thief, you know, the De Sica movie, and it was just like, just you know, open your eyes, like, "Oh, all right, there's a whole other world going on out there." 
But uh, but yeah, no, I I I. Uh, does that kind of where I'll you, cast my vote. Where you kind of saw movies as being, they could be art, they could be more important than just, you know, a Saturday at the movies? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, you know, that, uh, it does, you know. And again, that was kind of a golden age, not only for all of the, the young guys, you know, the, they were, you know, they were the movie brats at the time. Scorsese and Spielberg and Coppola and, you know, all those guys, you know, they were known as the movie brats. Mm -hmm. But also to be able to see the Fellini movies, the Truffaut movies, the Godard movies, you know, as they came out, you know, you'd see them in theaters. You know, that was the thing, too, is that, you know, in New York at the time, you know, we, as, again, now as high school kids and everything else, you know, we would be traveling into New York to go to the rep houses and the revival houses and the art houses. And, you know, also on Long Island here, we were lucky enough to have, you know, Cinema Arts, which back in the day had the hippie-like name of the New Community Cinema. Hmm. But that was the thing, that they were a... Here was, you know, within driving distance, a, uh, a revival house. You know, back in those days they showed a different movie every night. Yeah. You know, they weren't long runs. And again, they were showing, uh, they were showing, you know, foreign films. They were going back and showing, you know, old time classics. They brought in, you know, I, I, you know, that's where I saw, you know, uh, I saw Vin Vendors there. I saw Les Blank there. You know, they brought in directors, uh, you know, so it was a real, it was a real alive time for movies. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, too, I always remember that, uh, you know, you, you know all those, you know, you t- think all your fond memories and everything else, like sitting for hours, you know, in, you know, in college, like talking about movies, you know, just sitting right. there and, you know, going on and on about, you know, why it was great that Lenny was shot in black and white. And one of my favorite movie memories of all time was seeing Nashville, at college, and the lights go up, and uh, it was like split down in the middle. Half of the audience were raving, uh, this is the greatest movie they'd ever seen. Mm-hmm. Half of the audience was saying this is the biggest piece of crap they'd ever seen. <laughs> and literally, it like turned into like a fist fight. <laughs> punches. In the theater, people were, were, punches were thrown. That's... And it was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. Of course, me and my friends, we were sneaking out because right. no way we were throwing punches. But that's, you know, that's how, you know, it was interesting because it was people were so invested right. in the movies back then. And we were talking a little bit about this the other day, about, you know, the, what, what kind of movie audience you are, what kind of movie viewer you are. Some people are, are you know, natural critics. They'll, they'll dissect everything that's bad about the movie, what's wrong about the movie, why this doesn't make sense, continuity stuff. But... I feel like I I choose to kind of aim for the good stuff to talk about rather than even if it is kind of a crappy movie, you can find the good stuff. You can see the magic in the movie still. Absolutely. You know, yeah, I remember there was a guy one time I was talking to this guy and, uh, you know, that was the thing that he turned to me and he was like, yeah, you like everything. You like, you know, and I was like, you know what? I just love movies. Right. You know. You know, there was a, you know, there was a huge, there were years and years and years and years that, you know, in theaters, you know, I'd be seeing seven movies a week. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, that's what you did. Work days over, school is over, whatever you want to the movies. You know, so, you know, so we saw everything. And, uh, you know... There's something, you know, something entertaining. And again, that's the whole thing about as you watch a movie, you know, there's sometimes there are some movies you're going to hold to different standards. Right. Like, you know, there was, uh, you know, there was a whole bunch of movies uh, uh, back in the 70s, all of these, uh, like, uh, stock car racing movies and everything else. These all down south uh Gator, Gator Bait, and you know all these, you know, which which later on become like Smokey and the Bandit and everything else, right, right. you know. But there were all these like drive-in movies, these dirty indie yeah, movies. Yeah, I loved them. You loved them. Mm-hmm. You know, they were great. Guys who went out, 
you know, like all these Roger Corman, you know, era movies and else, you know, obviously these movies were made, you know, in seven days, you know, no budget and everything else, but they were entertaining. You know, right. for, for what they were, they were entertaining. You know, you're not going to, you know, look at, you know, something else and, you know, you're not going to look at, uh, you know, a piece of art and compare it the same way. But, yeah. yeah, no, I just, you know, I love movies. I was crazy for the movies. Right. <coughs> and, uh, you know, while, like you're saying, Jim Redding sees the best in movies, there are movies that come up a little short on your list. And uh, we talk about this one a lot over the years. And uh, why don't you talk about the, the movie that disappointed you most in life? I, ta- I, I, feel, I almost feel bad that, you're gonna, that we're going to have to go after this movie. But, uh, and again, this is a later movie, a more recent movie. But Cowboys and Aliens. How is, not the, how is that not the greatest movie of right. all time? How is not that? How do you have... How are we not talking about that as the one that got it right? How is that not... Somebody sat down and wrote that down in a pad. <laughs> Cowboys and Aliens. How, like... And, and like you said, that to me is just one of those movies. That to me is like that just like cynical idea of we have the idea. Now we're not going to try to develop it. We don't, we don't go anywhere with it. That this idea is going to, you know, and just, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, get a high profile cast in the movie and everything else. And that's going to do all the work. Like you said, well, when you watch that movie, and again, as I say this, I feel like a dope even jumping on this movie. But you get the sense that the people who made that movie, that they've never seen a Western before. Right. Because it doesn't look like a Western. Here's what we always talk about. The movies, there is no greater image in the movies than a galloping horse. Right. A horse. Ward Bond on that horse in The Searchers. Mm, that's... There's nothing better. In True Grit, when they're showing the John Wayne one, when the camera is up high and you see Rooster Cogburn on one side, the gang on the other side, they're going to go at each other. Then that camera comes out and we're watching those horses. And it's just like... <gasps> Eureka. This is thrilling. You watch that Cowboys and Aliens. The camera is always in the wrong place. <laughs> you don't get any sense of movement. It's like from fr- from face front, like with a telephoto lens, so like the, the horse doesn't even look like it's moving. Right. And you're like, oh my God, this poor thing is killing me. Yeah. I can't watch this movie. Fab- but that's the whole thing, is that don't be afraid of you know, it's a high concept idea and everything else. Don't be afraid of it. Play it as, you know, slightly tongue in cheek. You know, even though nowadays it's become nearly biblical, but the Star Wars movie, you know, am I a huge Star Wars fan? No. I love that first movie, though. Yeah. Because when you saw that first movie, first of all, he won me over. The very first, when the crawl begins. At the very beginning of the movie, you see his face, and now here comes the crawl, and it's, where are we? Chapter four. Right. And it's just like, well, we are talking before about the Batman serials from the 40s. We're watching this, and you go, there we go. Right. There we go. It's that Buck Rogers. And all of the, and the other great thing about it is that all of the nonsense, all of the MacGuffins about the Force, the this, the that, the Death Star, and everything else. It's all important, but I don't, I don't have to know about it, you know? I mean, later on, of course, now everybody knows, you know, right. the planet of Shmuel, and the, the mountains of Chrome, and, the, you know, you know, and that's what it becomes later on. But in the that first Star Wars movie, is a popcorn movie. It is, yeah. You it's, know, it's funny. Hysterically tongue, tongue funny. Cheek. And I was just reading... Uh, I would say it's an entertainment weekly or whatever. But they said great moments in that original Star Wars, like when Luke is there and you see the two 
sons in the background. Hmm. And he's just, and just like shh, quiet moments. You know, a lot of these movies now, they don't have, you're afraid of a quiet moment. Right. But that's what Cowboys and Aliens should have been. Cowboys and Aliens should have been a popcorn movie. Through and through. Through and through. Don't try to be anything else. And shoot the damn horses right. <laughs> now on the flip side, a recent movie that you were completely in love with. <sighs> it's been a bunch. You know, the, the one I'll say that that just caught me off guard, and, uh, and again, one we were talking about the other day, that Under the Skin. But what I got about this movie is that, first of all, the movie asks, as the movie, the movie just kind of jumps in, there's no explanation as to what's happening. Obviously, she's some sort of alien from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Her and the motorcycle guy are doing some sort of <laughs> excavating, mining of humanity. Right. Why, we don't know. What they're doing with these guys they get, they don't know. We, we're never explained to us. We don't know what planet she's from. We don't know that it's important for them to have them. Is it is the motorcycle man the John Merrick guy? The motorcycle man, no. Motorcycle, so she's there, so she's obviously this alien in human form. And the motorcycle guy is kind of her... Again, even that, you don't know quite what he is. Mm -hmm. They're partners. He's there to kind of clean up the mess after she's there. So he's kind of always around, always just, you know, within, yeah. you know, shouting distance of her. The other thing is that um, it's in Scotland. Right. So as you're watching it, even though they're speaking English, they're speaking with these thick Scottish burrs, it's nearly impossible to tell what the hell they're talking about. Right. You know, and it was filmed, you know, a lot of it was filmed, you know, with the uh, the hidden camera. Mm -hmm. You know, so she'd be talking to guys, and, you know, they didn't know who she was. You know, they didn't know a movie was being filmed. Wow, really? So, you know, they just kind of, you know, get involved with the story. But like I said, I love that I walked away from that movie, and uh, I had... 20 more questions yeah. at the end of the movie than I did at the beginning. And you like that. And all in a good way. Right. You know, not, it wasn't just like, what the hell? It didn't make any sense. You were trying to trying to put it all, you know, trying to put it all together. A lot of people poo-poo movies like that, like, like the open-ended kind of stuff. And you, you for this one, it worked? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Did it have, it looked just from the trailers like a Kubrick touch. Did it kind of have? It definitely had that kind of like icy kind of cold Kubrick feel to it. It was also one of those uh, if if that's not up for best music, best score, mm. something is something is wrong. Okay. Cuz the music is an Perfect. absolute part of that. You know, as you're watching as you're watching a movie, there's one particular theme that when it starts, that when you start to hear it, you already you're kind of getting on edge, right? Because you know, but like I said, this was you know in particular, this is a, a good year for movies. Yeah, but that, that's one that just in my head, just stays like stays with you. Wow, well, you know, just you know, stayed with me. Well, yeah, and for for whatever reason, the last three months or so, I've been all wrapped up in movies that disturb you, that kind of stay in your brain. I, I watched Eraserhead recently for the first time. But uh, one that we saw together is, that I think, the last movie that I truly, truly adored was that Whiplash. And talk about a movie that just stays with you, rots in your head. But, I don't know, some, something about those kind of movies uh, I've been gravitated towards recently. The kind of disturbing, not quite right kind of g g rots your stomach and brain a little bit. And the, and the whole thing, too, is that it's funny that all of those movies kind of share... That they're all people movies. That they're all about relationships more than right. about crazy special effects, or, oh, you yeah. know, or whatever. Two people in a room talking to you each know. other. That's the brunt of those movies. And uh, and like you said, you know, that whiplash is 
you know, we said it, you know, half tongue in cheek, but you know, that was that's the scariest movie I've seen in a long time. Right. You know, that was the most frightening movie. And brilliantly made the performances, you know, that J.K. Simmons, they should just back up the truck and, you know, just give him everything. Yeah. As you were watching it on the edge, you know, literally on the edge of your seat, oh, yeah. never knowing where this thing was going. Uh, you feel like the knot in your stomach being tightened, like, oh God, throughout yeah. the whole movie. No, it's a horror show. It's a horror show. And, but then, like, kind of what we're talking about is that after what you walk away from it and you start to think about it, you know, it's got, like, more holes than Swiss cheese in that movie. It's <laughs> just like, wait a minute, what? Hey, that doesn't, that and that doesn't make sense put together. But as a movie, right. as a movie experience, yeah. you know, absolutely, you know, absolutely great. And, you know, like I said, some things, another one we saw together, you know, Birdman. Yeah, yeah. The same thing is that, you know, the end of that movie, the hell? <laughs> the hell? You know? But okay. I, I'm with it, though. But getting there. See, that's the thing. Exactly. You know what? I trust the director. This is what he wants to do. As I was saying the other day, I remember a couple, th- two, three years back, seeing The Tree of Life, Terrence Malick. And there's at one point, early on in the movie, if you've seen the movie, the whole thing with the, you know, we're going back. We're going back in time. We're going back to the earth being created. Mm-hmm. And it's going on for a long time. We got a lot of lava flowing. We got a lot of planets We're in being, prehistoric age. And, we, you know, we're going to see dinosaurs. And there's a whole thing going on. And at one point I was sitting there. And I'm like, what the? What? And then part of me says, you know what? Let this guy. Let it. He wants to tell the story. This is the way he wants to tell it. Sit back. Yeah. Just don't. You want to complain? You go make your own movie. Exactly. Sit back and watch and watch this movie. Guardians of the Galaxy, the big hit of the summer. Guardians of the Galaxy is not a hit because the final scene. When everything blows up. Which is the the final scene of every Marvel movie of the past five years. Where we destroy a city, right? Guardians of the Galaxy is a, is a hit because of Groot, right? That's why Groot. Groot, Groot, the raccoon, the wrestler guy, right? The characters, yeah. That's why that movie, Chris Pratt's character. That's why that movie, Iron Man, isn't a hit because Iron Man is a hit because Robert Downey Jr. Right. Turns that character into somebody you have to be involved with. Right. Well, that's the thing. It, it's always going to boil down to. I remember years ago, one of the Tomb Raider movies. You know, talk about junk. But, you know, the Angelina Jolie, Laura Croft movies. Mm-hmm. We're watching it. Tony, my buddy, and I, we're watching the movie. And at one point, there's just a. Like, you see a little wall and. Angelina Jolie looks over, and so we're just kind of seeing her eyes. And that's the greatest special effect in the entire movie. Yeah. You know, her eyes, that face. And we know, and we can project onto that face. You know, that that's, the, you know, the greatest. I remember, again, you know, when I was in my 20s and we were all besotted with movies. We were all talking about, you know, the, you know what movie, if you could make movies, what would you, what would you, and again, this was kind of, you know, the glory days. You know, Star Wars were starting in all those movies. And I always said, you know, I said, you know, the movie I would make, I said, Melvin and Howard, which was a, a Jonathan Demme movie mm-hmm. about the guy who, uh, Paul Lamott playing uh, Melvin Dumar, the guy who said that Howard Hughes left him, you know, billions of dollars in his will. Right. And it's just a goofy little crazy movie, but you spend 90 minutes, two hours with that, and you know this guy. You know this character. Mm-hmm. 
and you know we see a little bit of his life and to me that was like you know that's it yeah and you have uh jason robarts who played a crazy character who might or might not have been howard hughes and he's in all of you know maybe 10 minutes of that movie but you can't you can't not think of him you know he just yeah is important throughout the movie but like I said, that's it. You know, give me people. Give me in Birdman, that Emma Stone, that moment with Emma Stone and, and Michael Keaton in the theater where he's been moaning his fate and she kind of turns at him and just gives it back to him right. about, you know, you're not the only person with, you know, concerns in life and everything else. And just, you know. Wakes him up a little bit. That's it. But also wakes up the audience, you know. Because right. it's like, you know. A lot of times, you know, these these huge epics can be mind numbing. Mm-hmm. It's true, but I love them. Now, for the, for the last little thought here, um, you know, obviously you you've seen kind of the growth of movies since you were a kid to now. What's what's the biggest takeaway? Are you just com- still completely mind blown thinking? how how far it's it's come or is there a, a big takeaway with that uh oh boy now i could i could just see you know how mind-blowing that could be starting off from when you were a wee little lad to you know but you know what you know what it is i think the thing is that the takeaway from it is the technology certainly changes and that, you know, when they went from silent to sound, you know, the, there were guys, you know, Chaplin included, who said, you know, that's the end. Movies as, a, movies as an art form are finished. You know, and now, you know, things more and more become uh, uh, special effects and, you know, motion capture and... You know, and all of this, and just, you know, things are changing exponentially. But if I were to take anything away, I think the one thing I take away from it, and it's a good thing, and I think the best movie makers always come back to that, is that it's always about people. It's always about a relationship between people. So whatever I need... Or cats. Or cats. You know, whatever tools I can use to tell that story, if I lose sight of that it's this interaction between people, then it just becomes, you know, then it's just mindless bubble. As a video game. Yeah. But if it's about, you know, if it's about people, if it's about a real story and really, you know, looking into somebody's eyes, you know, because that's the thing, you know, the camera is totally unflinching, you know, so you can't, you know, there's no, there's no place to hide. You know, there's great, in a, uh, in a lesser known, in a lesser liked uh, Scorsese movie, New York, New York, there's a moment Ball. about three quarters of the way through the movie where they were in a crowded nightclub and De Niro was on the phone we kind of know who he's talking to. We don't quite know who he's talking to. And he's just there on the phone, crowded, all this music around him. And the camera's just on his face. And we just have, it's just him and the audience. And we can kind of fill in the blanks for emotionally whatever is going on in his head there. Hmm. And again, that's, you know, that's what's so powerful. You know, give us, give the audience... Tell a story about people, give us a way in, and the audience, you give the audience a way in by not spelling everything out for us. Give us a chance to fill in some, you know, some details. Give us a chance to bring ourselves to the movie, and you're going to have a, you know, you're going to have a great movie. Right. And again, it, it can, it can it be with, uh, with special effects? Sure, in that Planet of the Apes reboot you know, that damn monkey, you know. That's a good damn monkey. That's a good damn monkey. But again, he's telling the story of, you know, of man and monkey. You know, it's just not an anonymous, you know, you know, we, we're really getting involved in that story. So that, yeah, like like we said, all of our 
favorite movies of this past year and, you know, all the way back and everything else, always go back to, you know, tell a good story, tell me about people. And, you know, and I'm hooked. I'm in. Hmm. You got me. 